everyone, welcome to the Unicon Open Source Support IAM Briefing. My name is Sharice Arrowood. I'm the Senior Director of our Identity Access Management Program here at Unicon, and I'll be facilitating the session today. With me today is the Unicon IAM team. You will hear from several team members as we move forward to share a bit about each IAM application we support. So today, the webinar focuses on the IAM products where Unicon provides support. Those products include CAS, SHIB, Grouper, Simple SAML, and Midpoint. So today, more specifically, our agenda is going to cover the following. So we are going to share some information about events and trends from the IAM community. Mike Grady is going to lead that discussion. We'll next shift to the application update, starting with Shibless, where you'll hear from Jonathan Johnson or JJ, followed by CAS updates presented by Dima Kopalinko. Paul Spotty will then discuss some highlights around Simple SAML PHP, and then we'll hear from Misa Moyed, who will discuss both Grouper and Midpoint. Lastly today, we have a little exciting news to share. Um, John Gasper will be giving you a little bit of information about some Unicon opportunities. I'm going to share all the specifics so that um, John will be able to give you all the icing on the cake exciting information that we have going on here at Unicon. Now with that said, let's go ahead and get started. And with that, I'll introduce Mike Grady. Hi, this is, uh, this is Mike, and uh, the, what I want to highlight in terms of upcoming events, uh, it's, as, as it notes there, this is a mix of, of events put on by Internet2, Aperio, and Educause. Uh, the first thing to note is um, the day after tomorrow, there's a webinar uh, in the In Common Webinar series. You, you see the times there, and you can look up uh, you know, on the web more information about it. But they're going to be talking about their training plans both this year and next year, in particular next year, they're, they're working on uh, a number of online training opportunities to supplement and go beyond the uh, in-person training opportunities that have been provided. So they'll be talking about what they're planning to do this year in terms of SHIB, Grouper, uh, Co-Manage, and Midpoint training, but uh, longer term, what, what they're working on in terms of online offerings. So that's the first thing to note. The next would be the yearly, uh, the annual Aperio meeting is in early June. Uh, there's an in-common in-person grouper training opportunity in the middle of June in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, one of the things they'll be talking about in that webinar on Thursday is, the, is reintroducing or introducing uh, Basecamp which is meant to be the in common base camp listed there in mid August meant to be more of a beginning you know i'm i'm kind of new to doing iam at my institution and i need a little bit of grounding in what all this federation and um, saml and and the uh, op operations and you know the internet 2 suite of software is so that's what base camp is intended to be of course the yearly educause meeting in the middle of october and then much later than it has been, the Internet to Technology Exchange meeting, which is in uh, you know, almost mid-December in, in New Orleans. So those, those are the events to, to keep in mind and, and look out for. And as they say, it'd be easy to find any more information on that on, on the web, or, or we could send URLs if, if you need. Um, in terms of trends, um, you know, we've, this slide, I think we had, la I mean, these, these continue to be trends. Uh, but the transition to them, you know, continues to be in progress. In Commons metadata query protocol to replace needing to consume and to consume the in common aggregate is supposed to be fully in production come about the middle of June. And I haven't heard anything to, to change that timeline. Um, and at which point you could greatly reduce the needed memory footprint of your IDP if you switch to using the, the MDQ rather than consuming the aggregate. Uh, of course, uh, either yourselves putting your IEM infrastructure into the cloud or, you know, uh, doing IDP as a service, like, you know, one, one of Unicon's offerings, um, you know, cloud deployments in general. And then, you know, the increased emphasis and move to adopting uh, DevOps practices of continuous integration using Docker containers, orchestration of the containers. Um, that process, which can uh, much more automate and and uh, 
make safer your changes to your, uh, you know, your key infrastructure that your institution is relying on. And then in terms of trends that are continuing to develop that aren't quite as uh, baked yet, um, OpenID Connect and OAuth. Now, of course, if you're using the latest CAS, you've had support for that in the software now since CAS 5. Uh, but that's becoming, uh, you know, adopted into the base shibboleth IDP, probably with, most likely with the release of 4X, it will be, you know, out of the box with it. Right now it's a plug-in from a group in, in Finland. Uh, it, it, the, uh, in common has a working group working on producing a deployment guide for how to best deploy and use the OpenID Connect and OAuth uh, support, which will be in the SHIB IDP. There's a number of groups, um, uh, particularly in Europe, but in common is, is participating, you know, looking at the broader issues as, as people move to using OpenID Connect and OAuth and, and need to scale it like they have SAML. You know, how do we do federation? Uh, how, do we, how do we name claims for like the edge person schema attributes? Uh, what are there additional scopes that should be defined and looking at how we might define uh, hybrid SAML OIDC federations. WebAuthn has been uh, codified and there's a, a, a lot of interest in WebAuthn and FIDO2 and in my role as a member of the Incommon Technical Advisory Committee, we got to see a demo from a group at Duke who have worked on a plugin for the SHIB IDP to support where the SHIB IDP can use WebAuthn and, and uh, FIDO2 um, and, and they're looking at doing that in lieu of, if you register a device in lieu of the password, um, and potentially also depending on the, on the type of device you're using, uh, maybe ultimately in lieu of also doing Duo for MFA. Uh, so there's some interesting work happening there that will hopefully be made available to the community more broadly. And then uh, trends like l in folks beginning to think about Internet of Things devices and perhaps managing those identities. Unicon has seen some, uh, some RFPs out there where institutions are proposing to manage things like IoT devices as, as another type of identity in their identity and access management system. So those are, those are the things we wanted to uh, bring up today, and, and thanks. Excellent. I don't see any questions. I just wanted to take a quick pause in case there were any questions for Mike at this time. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. JJ. Hey, thanks, Sharice. Let's talk a little bit about Shibboleth and what's going on in the Shibboleth IDP and the SP. Since the last time we've talked, there have been a few releases that have been made. Just as a reminder, the Shibboleth developers have an official, um, <clears throat> excuse me, have, have an official policy out there that they end of life versions as soon as they release new versions, which practically means for you that you ought to keep up with versions. But just as a reminder as well, if you are an open source support subscriber of Unicom, we will do everything we can to support those older versions of any of the software that we support. As you can see up there, the latest version of the IDP is version 3.4.4, and the latest version of the SP is version 3.0.4. Upgrading to those versions should not be that big of a deal, particularly if you have kept up with the latest versions anyways. There should be very few changes that you have to do unless you want to take advantage of some of the newer features that are available in the IDP or the SP. So speaking of the IDP, we can change the slide there, Sharice. There are a few new features available out there. One of the uh, most noteworthy, and that is, oh, unfortunately, it's a little timely with the job apocalypse that kind of came down upon us at the beginning, beginning of this year with the drop of support by Oracle for free versions of the JVM, as the IDP starts supporting the later versions of the JVM, 
they've noticed some incompatibilities between some of their underlying libraries and they've had to update some of those libraries as well to support the later versions of the JVM. And so to that end, they've got this new unbounded provider for LDAP that one could take advantage of. You're gonna to wanna to use that, particularly if you're looking at, <coughs> at a JVM later than version eight. Another mantra out there of the ship developers is that you should be using fewer and fewer beans for your configuration and script as much as you can. So to allow that, they have allowed significantly more scripted references out there in the configuration so that you can use scripts inside of your configuration. As Mike mentions, mentioned, there is work right now uh, driving towards a version four of the IDP, you will start seeing more and more deprecation notices out there in your logs. Generally, those are pretty user friendly and they will tell you exactly what you need to do to make sure that you are on the right path to an upgrade for version four. Uh, beyond that, there are, there are several other smaller changes out there uh, make sure that you go out there and read the release notes to see what all changes have have made it into the IDP. <clears throat> Excuse me. A particular note there is that Duo and ECP now so that you can actually use a Duo flow if you're using uh, something other than a WebSSO session. On to the SP. There is a native IIS version 7 for... SP out there that better integrates with with IIS 7. That was a complete rewrite of several different pieces of the SP to make it significantly easier to integrate and it works significantly better now. Um, <clears throat> also included with the newer versions of the SP is this stateless clustering. No longer do you have to have a storage service out there on your server to necessarily support a clustered deployment of the SP. Previously, you had to have something like a database out there or a memcache that would share that session information with all of your SP cluster members. Now there is built into the in-memory storage surface service a cache replay mechanism that it will store several bits of information inside of a cookie that can be read by any member of that cluster and essentially recreate the session on any server. Now you do have a couple of caveats with that of course, but for most deployments that will be sufficient. <clears throat> Beyond that, there are, like I said, there are some simpler configurations out there, a lot, a lot more hand-holding for us as deployers out there. For instance, that simpler vhost support. Um, <clears throat> but beyond that, there are significantly more release notes out there as well that you're going to want to check out. <clears throat> On the Unicon front, we've been doing some significant work inside of our open source support sustaining engineering program. We do, con we do continue to maintain several plugins out there for the Shibboleth S IDP, excuse me, the Shibboleth IDP. In particular, we have tested our Hazelcast storage service for use in the Shibboleth IDP version 3.4, and that, that does work. So if you do run into any problems with that, feel free to reach out and open a bug report. We've also been working on a Redis storage service. If you happen to use Redis in your institution, if you'd like information about that, feel free to reach out to us. We've also been doing work to make sure that our Docker images are updated to the latest versions of the IDP and SP. We have also been doing some work with some reporting and statistics coming out of the IDP. 
But the biggest chunk of work that we've been doing in the Shibboleth open source support sustaining engineering is the Shibboleth IDP user interface that we've partnered with the internet to to deliver to you all. As someone that does IDP deployments a lot, even I sometimes forget some of the little knobs and buttons that you can turn and twist to integrate an SP with the IDP. And I like to fall back when possible upon some sort of inter user interface to guide me because <laughs> honestly, I've got other things that I'd like to use my mind for, remember. So in partnership with the internet too, we have built this UI to help help deployers do their day-to-day -day jobs integrating service providers with the IDP. Most of the functionality that we that we are working on right now deals with the metadata files for your service providers and for met managing the metadata providers for the IDP. And here we can see kind of the dashboard view that one gets when lo one logs in. Beyond this view, if we can change to the next slide there, Sharice. We have support there for the individual SPs. As I say, you can go out there and create an SP metadata file through this user interface. You can set up your relying party configuration, taking advantage of the metadata-driven configuration of the version 3.4 IDP in your metadata file that you create for that relying party or service provider. You can also go out there both in importing a, um, a metadata file and setting up an a file back HTTP metadata provider pulling in remote sources. And you can see there that we're actually setting up a metadata provider there to use the uncommon aggregate in the upper right hand corner. And in the lower right hand corner, that, that's just more of the relying party configuration that we have, particularly in attribute release. So our idea here is that we're trying to take care of 80% of the work that IDP deployers have to do day to day. We don't do a lot of the initial configuration that one might do when initially installing the IDP, but hopefully you'll only ever have to do that once. And then from that point on, we hope that what we have provided here will be sufficient for your day to day, day to day jobs. Of course, we have made our first real public release. We have had a webinar recently a couple weeks ago on it. You should find a link on our website out to the webinar if you'd like to go back and review that. We do plan on having more webinars specifically focused on different functionality in the SHIB UI going forward. Uh, if you're interested in it, if you are an open source support subscriber, feel free to reach out to your technical account manager. If you're a, if you're a services client of Unicon, feel free to reach out to your project manager. And if you're neither, feel free to reach out to Unicon through our website. Thank you. Thanks, JJ. It looks like we might have some questions. Let's check those out. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. The first one, when the MDQ is released, will one have to update their IDP? From it depends upon the version that you're running, but the MDQ support goes pretty far back in, in the IDP. Cool. So a, there, there are some newer knobs and buttons out there in the newer versions of the IDP that you might take advantage of. But again, if you're using a later version anyways, you should not have a problem. Yeah, I guess what, the, what I'd add, JJ, is that, yes, if you want to use MDQ, you'll have to configure to use it Correct. Uh, in your IDP. But when it, the switchover happens, the aggregate is not going away. Um, although I know there's, there's talk of the signing cert being updated. I think... Um, and so there may have to look to see the, the, if the signing cert for the main aggregate is going to change or it's just going to be a different signing cert for the MDQ service. So you, 
when that goes live, you don't have to switch, but to take advantage of it, yes, you would definitely have to change your IDP config to yeah. use MDQ in lieu of consuming the aggregate. Correct. But, but that does not necessarily require being on version 3.4.4. I wish I could remember a specific version, but I remember that we were able to do it at least in 3.3. I'm pretty sure the support has been there in three, but what's been yeah. added is there's more knobs and dials or more caching controls in that. Yeah. They do a little finer grain. So there are, there are some advantages being on the latest release, but not a requirement. Yes, exactly. All right. Thank you. I think based on where we are, we have a lot more to share. So we will come back to the rest of these questions. Thanks. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dima, who's going to talk to us about CAD. Uh, thank you, Cherise, uh, and hello, everyone. Um, so I'll be glad to talk to you about the latest uh, developments in the world of CAS server. Um, currently, a uh, generally available version of CAS is 6.0.3, and the development team is actively working on a new major uh, feature release, which would be labeled as CAS version 6.1.0. Uh, currently, there are several release candidates available uh, for test drive, with the latest being 6.1.0 RC3. I also want to uh, mention that uh, 5.3 line of case server is entering a so-called uh, security patch mode, uh, where on June 29th of this year, it will only receive uh, critical security patches, if any, um, and then it is scheduled uh, for a full end of life on July 29th of next year. Okay, and next slide, please. And now I would like to overview uh, some of the new features which will be available in the next uh, major feature release version of CAS, which is 6.1. So CAS 6.1 contains many new features and of course bug fixes. So let me highlight several notable uh, interesting features that will be available in this particular version. Uh, so first item in the list uh, is uh, SAML2 uh, metadata management via JSON. So this is a new facility in CAS server, uh, which would allow an operator uh, to define SAML metadata for any given SP uh, via a simple JSON structure. Uh, this would be useful in cases uh, when uh, certain SPs would not provide their metadata, but only instructions on how to build one, uh, right? And so this would uh, relieve an operator from crafting their own SP metadata XML via some online tools, for example, and, uh, but instead create a simple JSON uh, structure with uh, endpoints, uh, point CAS server to it, and let CAS server uh, dynamically create SP metadata by reading the simple JSON structure for each uh, such SP. So useful facility there. Uh, next on the list is uh, git back to service registry. So in this version, um, CAS gains an ability to store and pool JSON and YAML service registry definitions in remote Git repositories. Uh, this will be uh, pretty useful in distributed CAS uh, deployment scenarios with uh, uh, multiple nodes uh, while using JSON or YAML service registries, right? And it will... Um, relief uh, uh, operator from not relying on custom synchronization scripts to keep service definition uh, between nodes in sync and let Git do, do its job for this task. Um, next on the list is uh, delegated authentication provisioning. So uh, in a delegated authentication scenarios, by default, uh, user profiles that are extracted from external uh, identity providers are merged into CAS authentica authenticated principles, uh, but are not stored or tracked anywhere else outside of CAS. So in this version, CAS does provide additional options to, to allow such profiles to, to be managed outside of CAS and or to be provisioned into external identity stores, um, allowing operators, for example, to optionally link 
external slash guest accounts with their uh, equivalent found in um, authentication sources used by CAS. So sort of like a mini uh, provisioning facility there. Um, next item is a groovy acceptable usage policy. So um, in this version, um, CAS server gains an ability to perform uh, acceptable usage policy checks uh, via simple groovy language scripts uh, recognized and callable from uh, CAS for authentication engine. So another usable, uh, useful feature there. Um, next item is uh, custom login fields. So um, this is a new facility uh, which adds an ability to uh, dynamically extend uh, the standard login uh, form presented by CAS um, by including additional custom fields to be populated by users during authentication um, transaction. Uh, so such fields are taught to CAS using um, simple uh, property settings and are then bound to authentication flow at runtime and uh, made avail available to you know, all authentication handlers that wish to, to impose additional processes and rules using, using uh, data collected from these fields. So uh, uh, as you could imagine, a very useful facility uh, to simply extend core CAS authentication flows. Um, next item on the list is uh, per service proxy and service ticket policies. So additional policies uh, can now be assigned to each service definition to uh, um, uh, basically uh, those the okay so those are the expiration policies right can now be uh, conditionally decided at per application basis. Um, any such per service uh, uh, policies for, for tickets expiration uh, would override the default global settings, right? So until now, you only have global settings in uh, cas.properties. Now you have the ability to have a fine-grained uh, settings per service. And uh, last but not least is a per service single sign-on session participation policy. So uh, basically, those additional policies can, can now be assigned also to each service definition to, to control participation of, of that particular uh, client application in an existing single sign-on session. So if conditions hold true, oh, sure, can we go back one? Yeah, so, sorry. So if conditions hold true, CAS will honor uh, the existing SSO session and will not challenge the user for credentials, right? If conditions fail, uh, then user may be asked for credentials. So such fine-grained per-service policies can be chained together and executed in order. Um, uh, policies available out of the box currently are uh, authentication date predicate, last time used predicate. And of course, being a pluggable interface-driven uh, there is also uh, uh, an opportunity to implement and plug in custom SSO participation policy uh, should such needs arise. And that's basically an overview of just some of the new features that will be available in CAS version 6.1. Uh, but of course, at this time, you could give it a test uh, drive with uh, release candidates uh, versions. Thank you. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, and now I, I just want to uh, highlight uh, the work um, on CAS server that's been done under CAS Open Source Support Sustaining Engineering Umbrella. Um, a lot of effort has been made on developing CAS 6.1 features visible to end users, but also engineering time has been devoted uh, to focus on fixing various bugs uh, and refactoring and improving uh, internal CAS code base. Uh, and here are just some of the uh, examples of these uh, internal uh, CAS uh, code, code base items uh, that, that's been done. Um, for example, uh, refactoring registered service YAML HTTP message converter to support only appropriate type of objects, that's a bug fix. Um, instrumenting CAS uh, code base with a more comprehensive uh, debug and trace login to improve uh, troubleshooting ability and serviceability for CAS uh, operators. Uh, also implementing 
event-based central logging facility to listen to core CAS events and log uh, uh, more comprehensive data about those events, also enhancing uh, serviceability of CAS server uh, for CAS operators. And many internal duplicate code cleanup and refactorings uh, to further improve uh, readability and maintainability of uh, uh, CAS code base. And also, um, among, among this work under CAS OSS Sustaining Engineering umbrella, there is a being release of a new version, a version 2.3 of uh, CAS Client Auto Config Library, uh, that, uh, which brings uh, Spring Boot dependency up to date uh, with the version uh, 2.1.4. And that is all I have for CAS updates. Thank you all, and I appreciate your attention. Thanks, Dima. Let's see, I don't see any questions specifically about CAS at this point. Oh, we'll just pause for a minute if anybody wants to type anything in. All right, I think we're okay to move forward. With that, I'm going to introduce Paul, who's going to talk to us about Simple Sample PHP. Thanks, Therese. So last time we talked about uh, Simple Sample, we covered release 117. Uh, we're still on release 117 with a point two release. Uh, if you're using any previous versions, uh, please make sure that you're updated to at least 116.3 uh, for security purposes. Uh, one of the biggest things in version 17 is up, you know, bug fixes, upgrading a lot of the some of the frameworks and things like that. For that, we have PHP 5.5. Really won't affect every, anyone, um, although if you have customizations and that kind of thing, it, it may have some syntax effects. The biggest thing in 117 to point out is there is an experimental user interface and admin inter interface built on Twig. And what that is is you can optionally enable that and it has a refreshed feel for P simple SAML, PHP. And what is going to happen as we move towards two, that's probably going to become the default. Um, so it's something you may want to check out as you prepare for moving on to version uh, 2.0. Next slide, please. So just a few highlights from the 117, as I mentioned. Uh, IDP side has support for ECP um, for all your non-web-based SSO flows. Uh, there are many XML metadata handling improvements. Um, should be some speed improvements as well. Uh, a big support, a big thing to support for SAML subject ID. Uh, if you recall, that's the change from uh, using name ID or subjects for identif identification in SAML. Um, so it's kind of a newer thing. So it now has support for that. Uh, a few of the underlying defaults uh, as far as security has changed. So SHA-256 is now the standard. Uh, as I mentioned, many improvements in docs code and quality and, and style. So uh, as far as the roadmap, there is a 118 release out uh, coming down the pike. And as I mentioned, 2.0 is, is, is the big thing out there. Uh, if you want any, if you have any more you know, questions or, or, or about that roadmap, you can look on the Simple Sample PHP website. There is a roadmap is listed there. Um, if you have any questions about 117 or changes or releases, you know, I, notes, uh, that's all available on the website as well. And that's it for me. Thanks, Paul. So let's see, at this time I don't see any questions about Simple Sample PHP. We're gonna go ahead and pause a minute here as well. If anybody wants to type anything in and Paul's happy to respond. All right, I think we're a go. With that, we're going to shift on to Grouper, and I'm going to introduce Misa. Take it away. Thanks, Therese. Hi, everybody. So let's talk about Grouper a little bit. Um, the current release of the Grouper software is 2.4. I think it's just, um, a fairly recent release that came out in the spring of 2019 uh, with 2.5 sort of planned to come out in the second quarter of the year, also relatively uh, recent uh, in the coming down in the pipeline. 2.4 has a lot of um, interesting improvements and changes sort of baked into it. Um, and uh, before I get there, I want to sort of talk a little bit about 2.5 and 2.6 and what's sort of coming down the pipe and things that you can sort of look forward to. Um, in 2.5 and then namely the, the feature release thereafter 2.6, 
Um, there are some very interesting improvements and sort of new features baked in uh, that the developer development team is working on. Um, you know, the ability to uh, set uh, some kind of an expiration policy, to delete groups automatically, to improve pagination support, to improve group shell. For those of you that sort of add, um, uh, you know, spin, uh, spin up jobs or uh, add stems and folders and groups and such through the shell, through the shell, um, these would be super attractive. There is also some really exciting stuff um, in 2.6 planned. Hopefully, again towards the end of 2019, I believe at least that's the tentative plan, <clears throat> sort of scheduled. That would um, most notably, at least the one that I like very much the, the most, is. Um, a configuration wizard for PSPNG. At, at the moment, the, the, the configuration for the provisioner seems to be rather unintuitive and sort of difficult to follow and understand, and hopefully with a configuration wizard sort of baked in, that would, that would simplify things quite a bit, as well as potentially um, interest from the group of development team to take in um, a, 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 a provisioner developed by Unicon that basically provisions groups out to Office 365 and Azure AD. And, and we hope that the, the, the provisioner basically becomes part of the group of software and sort of baked in as, as you move forward. But for now, back to reality and back to group 2.4 and no disrespect to Eminem fans and those that follow gravity. Um, if we switch to the next slide, Therese, uh, we'll talk a little bit about group 2.4. So 2.4 uh, was released some time ago uh, this year in 2019. And since then, there have been many, many sort of patches that have come about and have been released. So, uh, if you truly want to take advantage of this, uh, some of the some of the newer features and enhancements, not all of, not all of which, of course, is listed here. But nonetheless, uh, we generally recommend that you keep up to date with the patches and, and the upgrades as they come out, as we generally do with any any application that we support here. So, some of the some of the more notable enhancements <clears throat> in Group 2.4 are listed here: the ability to deprovision uh, people access uh, people's access to a particular group, general cleanup whether it has to do with UI or dependency updates or general you know, upkeep of the group of software underneath and just you know, refreshments all around um, to configuration and UI. Some of, the, some of the interesting stuff around the cleanup is the ability to define your sources.xml and ehcache.xml files now in properties. And this, uh, I think, was baked into Grouper uh, a long time ago, but it sort of never really, I think, caught on as something that would be, uh, you know, attractive and exciting, and I think that that very much is as, as it attempts to keep configuration all consistent in one spot. And uh, what else? Uh, so, grouper attestation certainly is available. Where periodically, certain group owners or administrators could be asked to um, review members and you know consent or not consent to a particular operation or member in a particular group. There are grouper templates available, as sort of the slide notes up top and the. In the northeast corner where you have effectively the same concept as a workflow where you design some kind of a policy slash workflow where how groupers should create a folder and groups within that folder and how to set permissions and so on and so forth then you've got this template and based on which grouper would be able to sort of automatically apply certain policies workflows and um, strategies as you go about configuring your groups and such and this really comes into play it really shines if you consider the um the, um, the, the, the strategy for naming folders in group hierarchy and such that are sort of recommended by the group of deployment guide and uh, the, the, what used to be the tier um, sort of uh, strategy for naming folders and using the template certainly would allow you to apply a template and have it sort of automatically follow that template and create the structure that is recommended in that guide. And of course, last but not least, the, the, the packaging options certainly have improved quite a bit. There are native Docker images available that you can certainly build from source or you know, build on top of base images that are available and published uh, under the tier slash grouper, uh, grouper um, image name up on Docker Hub and various other places. And um, certainly this is generally has been one of the trends in terms of grouper deployments where people are moving more and more towards a, a, a Docker container, I should say, packaged version of a grouper deployment rather than you know, the traditional native install. So moving on to OSS Sustaining Engineering. So mostly we are keeping busy with Grouper in two notable categories. One is, of course, the Grouper Deployment Guide that uh, we've been collaborating on with um, tier slash Internet 2 folks to make sure that there is a, a consistent strategy and a, a catalog of best practices for one to go ahead and install Grouper and configure things and so on and so forth. This is 
uh, spearheaded by Bill Thompson and various other folks in the working group working on the guide. And of course, we have a pretty heavy hand in making sure that Docker images uh, that provide a, a grouper deployment or a grouper training environment are kept up to date and are you know sane and functional in the way that you would like to have them deployed. My colleague John Gasper, in fact, is uh, the man sort of leading that effort uh, moving forward. Um, and that's uh, I think all we have at this point about grouper. I'll, I'll pause to see if there are any particular questions in this category. Do we have any questions, Therese? Nope, it looks like everything was wrapped up. Nothing specific outstanding for group for at this point. So I think we will go ahead and we can move on and talk about midpoint. Excellent, thank you. Yes, yeah, so moving on uh, to midpoint. Again, current reality of the midpoint uh, uh, software package is that version 3.9 is out um, and has been out for some time. While the development team is sort of focused on the next major release of the software that is 4.0 and this is a version that is going to bring you you know earth-shattering you know awesome fantastic stuff as the sort of the version number denotes but more specifically in terms of you know groundbreaking effects and effects and features and impacts the, the two most notable things are that 4.0 certainly is going to support and perhaps even require Java 11 and it updates the underlying libraries and you know the entire foundation of the software platform to make sure everything checks out with Java 11 and all the configuration and the XML stuff and so on and so forth can all be parsed and consumed and understood by the Java 11 uh, you know, platform underneath. And there's uh, the second most notable thing, which is that the, uh, the development team has announced the, uh, the, the ability for subscribers to opt for what is called LTS or long-term support for 4.0. This is a version that you know, is, is, is tagged as one that subscribers can certainly qualify to opt into for long-term support where patches would be, you know, incoming for, for longer than a year. I think the, 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 the term support is two years, I believe. And of course, as those patches are sort of made available to open source, you know, mere mortals and, and other folks in the community certainly can take advantage of it and use them. Uh, but it is something that, uh, that uh, you know, for, for those that subscribe to the, to the uh, development platform and you know, have a subscription, they can certainly take, it, take advantage of it. I think as my colleague said, uh, JJ said, and others have said, that the, the support um, agreement and the clauses that you would find on the wikis and such certainly are those that are advocated by the development team. At Unicon, we do whatever it is that we have to do to support any version of the software that you run, whether it's Midpoint or whether it's Grouper, Shibboleth, CAS, et cetera. We'll, obviously, our recommendation is for you to stay on what is supported by the community in general, but if for whatever reason you cannot do that, certainly you're not going to be rejected from us. Anyways, so that's on the outset what Midpoint is um, planning to charge ahead with. Let's talk a little bit about some new stuff coming down the pipeline in 3.9 and 4.0 to some degree. Um, so 3.9 and 4.0 4, 4 in general basically present improvements in all categories of of the midpoint ecosystem, whether it's UI or connectors and customization, security, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the notable ones that I could probably throw out there to sort of gauge your interest would be um, in the UI category, there's a lot of improvements. <coughs> improvements around pagination support and generally performance of things as you set up you know, uh, your organizational structure and hierarchies and, and, and you know, uh, you load thousand subjects and such. Um, and identities into midpoint and you know you want everything to be sort of listed out nicely in the UI These are some of the things that have gone into UI in addition to a few other um, new screens that mainly report back system configuration and internal configuration of midpoint as, as it sort of relates to Objects and entities and users and various other rules that you might have uh, implemented inside midpoint then we have the, the connector plus provisioning sort of category of features um, connector certainly I think the the underlying framework that handles the the provisioning job and data import and so on the con ID framework certainly has been upgraded a little bit uh, more aggressively in the past uh, month or so maybe in the, in the past few months in fact to provide much better support for LDAP and AD integration whether it's supporting timestamps that are whether it's supporting change propagation for passwords across LDAP and AD and uh, whether it's whether it's about again pagination support and bulk operations and such, generally improvements have sort of been applied across the board to make sure these connectors 
and uh, you know the, the 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 provisioning task in, entirely can can do its job where it can. And in the same sort of category, while we're talking about this midpoint 4.0, I think one of the biggest things that's coming down the pipe. There was a lot of stuff I mentioned. Java 11, I mentioned uh, long-term support, etc. And if you sort of check out the roadmap document on the midpoint wiki, you'll find a lot of other stuff. But one thing that seems really exciting, um, especially in the performance category of things, is the ability to handle provisioning and bulk operations and things, uh, data import operations and things in that category asynchronously. The connector framework that exists today in Midpoint, the Khan ID framework, generally wasn't designed and isn't designed to handle asynchronous operations. Um, and it is a project that is shared by not only Midpoint, but by a few other IDM platforms that take advantage of the shared common code base. So I think these folks are all getting together and they're trying to figure out what is it that we have to do in order to make sure this framework and all the connectors that build on top of it, as well as the IDM platforms that take advantage of all of this, can, take, uh, can use asynchronous operations uh, when it comes to provisioning and data import, et cetera, et cetera. And this is something that apparently is, is a monumental effort. It is, uh, at this point, a prototype. Um, in prototype stage, at least in midpoint, then I think other other companies and platforms that build on top of the on top of this shared framework, like Apache Syncopy and a few others, um, probably would step in to make sure this thing can can uh, can be improved. As as you can imagine, if you've got many 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 hundreds of thousands and millions of identities, a synchronicity would be would be tremendously helpful in terms of performance. So, I think that's all we have for midpoint. Uh, I'll pause and see if. If I've confused everybody to a reasonable degree, and if there's any questions, otherwise, thank you very much. All right, thanks, Misa. So our last right. topic of the day, which we're real excited about, is actually to share some Unicon opportunities. Make sure you're aware of some of the direction that Unicon has moved forward in. And with that, I'll introduce John Gasper. Hello, all. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, three different things, uh, three different opportunities that Unicon uh, has uh, potentially for you. Uh, the first is the Docker consulting and training. Um, IT organizations around the world are beginning to adopt containerization. Uh, for those of uh, you know following in the IAM world or living in the IAM world, um, TAP, which was formerly known as Tier, has put together Docker images for the Shibboleth IDP, the Shibboleth IDP, the admin UI, uh, the SHIB SP, Grouper, Midpoint, and Co-Manage. Um, switching to use those containers and using Dockerized packaging uh, can make management of your applications much easier. Um, it's, uh, it just makes uh, the deployment and, and consistency of getting the application updates uh, sent from like test to QA to production much, much uh, more streamlined. Um, so perhaps you've heard about all of this stuff and you're just not sure you know, where to get started. Unicon, we can help you uh, migrate your applications over to a Docker environment. We can uh, get automation in place that'll package your changes, push the changes to the servers um, with no or low uh, user interaction. So maybe you want the changes automatically to propagate to test, but you're going to manually um, you know, decide which uh, commit um, is going to make it, you know, when that commit makes it into production. Uh, we can also provide you with a two-day training on Docker and on Jenkins, and Jenkins being the open source automation tool that uh, we kind of default to unless there's a, uh, another tool that you'd prefer to use. The next item is the Federation Bridge, and many organizations are considering moving to um, hosted IDPs like Okta, OneLogin, Azure, or Google, and using those as the primary web SSO systems, but they don't support uh, in common and other federations, uh, at least not very easily. Uh, so Unicon is now offering a federation bridge that fills that gap. Our service uh, bridges between your primary IDP, whichever one of the list or, or additional ones that I had mentioned, and all of the in common service providers. So you register our lightweight IDP within common and when a user hits an in common based service provider the service provider will redirect them to our bridge our bridge will transparently pass them on to okta one login etc where they hand where that application handles the user's authentication then they send the response back to us we repackage it specifically for the sp and the user gets into the service 
if this is a direction you're going down, we'd love to have a conversation uh, with you. Uh, go ahead and reach out uh, through one of the um, mechanisms that uh, the others have mentioned uh, throughout the, the call or the webinar today. Uh, the last thing is um, IAM assessments. Um, <laughs> you looked at your IAM infrastructure and wondered, you know, there's got to be a better way. Or perhaps the manager has been asking, you know, is Campus IAM providing the right services for our constituents? Uh, we do, we as in Unicon, we do IAM assessments and we can help your organization look at their setup from either a high level view, um, the macro lens, or we can zoom in and focus on the specific parts of your operation. Uh, we can tailor um, the assessment to really whatever specific question or sets of questions you're looking for. So those are three opportunities that uh, Unicon um, can support you, our clients with. And uh, again, if you are interested in any of those, uh, please just reach out. Thanks, John. All right, that brings us to the end of our topics today. It looks like we don't have any open questions. Also, I wanna thank you for your time. Uh, we appreciate your participation and attendance, and we hope you found the call valuable. Have a nice afternoon.